Hi, uh, thank you for uh, staying with us uh, through the uh, late afternoon. Uh, they stopped checking at the gate, so you know, you know that this is sort of the, the slow time of the conference, but it's great to see such a big crowd. I want to talk to you about scaling. And, uh, and I, think, I think I should start by saying that we live in a, in a very, very exciting time. So exciting, okay, here we go. We live in a very exciting time. Uh, when you, know, you can't really walk down uh, lower Manhattan without running into bankers, turning to each other and saying, hey, what's your strategy for blockchain? Okay. So uh, the word itself has become one of those special words that doesn't require an article. It's not a blockchain, the blockchain, it's just blockchain. And the only other word that I can think of uh, when I think of a word in the same category is the word God. Right? We don't think about a God or the God. And, uh, uh, every finance company, as I mentioned, is thinking about its blockchain strategy, what it should be. At the same time, we've had about $5 billion go into various different venture capital funded firms and about $10 billion crowdfunded by us. That's an amazing outcome, one that I would never have foreseen. There are people paying money for zero knowledge proofs. Right? So this is a, a fa fancy, funny world that we live in at the moment. And I've been at meetings where at the table there were people who operated darknet markets talking to people from the Bank of England. So we have hundreds of cryptocurrencies. It's really a fascinating, exciting time. And uh, one of the things I use to sort of gauge the health of a, of a social movement, if you will, is to look at social indicators. And if you go to YouTube, there are more songs written about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies than there are about songs about uh, Facebook, Google, and even the free software movement combined. So this is all fascinating. That's why we're all here. There's something really genuinely gripping here. And yet, we've actually gotten ourselves into a bit of a pickle. We sold to the public a vision that our technology cannot quite deliver. So there's this big gap between what we've been telling people that we can do and then what actually we're capable of doing. Uh, the simplest thing that we can point to is the main idea that we sold, the thing that got it all started in the first place, was a payment system. And if you look at, uh, say, a payment system, like you know, something like uh, Venezuela switching to Bitcoin, Every adult Venezuelan would end up being able to go to the store once every 36 days. You buy a packet of gum, that's it. You don't get to go to the store for another month. And so that's really a bit of a problem. Uh, if you think about it as if you sort of back down from this and you say, look, we're not going to be able to scale that way. Da, da, da. This thing is not really a payment system anymore. Let's think of it as a, as a store of value. We're going to sell it to the masses as if it's got something that's got inherent value, where you can store your life savings and you'll be able to pull them out reliably. Well, fine, let's look at it as a store of value. I don't really believe in this narrative myself. I think it's incredibly misleading. But um, even on its own merits, uh, without you know, putting any kind of judgment on the idea itself, it's a bad store of value because value leaks out of the system through the miners to the electricity companies. And that's about, to, uh, about uh, $300 million annually. So it's a lot of value leaking out. And, uh, Finally, so what's going on underneath? What is the core value proposition of these systems that we're telling uh, people? Like what the SEC is saying, well, some things are sufficiently centralized, some things are decentralized, and some things are not. Well, how decentralized are these systems? If you look carefully, uh, you'll find that uh, the vast majority of the mining in Bitcoin is accomplished by 19 mining pools. Okay? So some people will say, well, there are many more miners than that, and da, 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 da. Well, it doesn't matter whether or not they have incorporated together at the, uh, at the city hall, whether or not they are, they're part of a corporation. They actually concretely came together. They're part of the same enterprise. They pooled themselves into 19 entities. They're not really checking if the, if the entity is being run. Most of the miners that are part of a pool are incapable of detecting malfeasance by the pool operator. So these are really just centralized operations uh, to about 19 independent actors. Ethereum is just 11. And EOS gets maligned for its centralized uh, governance. And if you look at it, they actually have 21 block producers. They're actually slightly better than most of the things out there that are really priding themselves on how decentralized they are. So there's a big gap. And uh, the core problem, I think, is that the systems that we have are incapable of scaling to the le levels that we need them to scale to. Bitcoin's core to transactions per second is around 3 TPS. Um, Ethereum is about somewhere between 10 and 15 TPS. And uh, Visa prides itself on 2,000 to 5,000 sustained TPS with peaks to 50,000. And if you actually go to a, an actual commerce site, 
you need to do something like 300,000 TPS. 3 TPS is about the speed of the Bay Bridge, if you want to think about it. It's three cars per second. Right? So that's not, really not all that much. Just, we can support the Bay Bridge with our payment system. So we have a long ways to go. And, uh, and these are not academic concerns. Right? So if you look at uh, what happened, we've seen what happens when we have a very, very popular application on Ethereum. CryptoKitties brought Ethereum down for about a week. Right? And um, if you also go back and look at the Bitcoin uh, fee uh, situation, the fees spiked uh, when, uh, when the network was congested. And uh, so what are we going to do about this? So, so, what's, okay, so here are my predictions for what one can do. And we're currently in a phase where we're doing exactly the following. Uh, we start taking what we have. We repackage it in different ways. We go back to things we know. We just kind of sort of put a different twist on them, and we measure them using very creative measurement techniques. So we're living through one of these eras where you're going to see immense numbers. I'm, I'm not sure what kinds of numbers, how many digits got flashed at you earlier this morning. I'm sure they exceeded seven figures. So those numbers are all uh, in bogus territory. Okay? So, uh, so there are lots of uh, very well-known tricks that people pull, uh, including um, involving creative measurement techniques, bundling transactions together into big bunches, and then you, know, you make only one decision on a terabyte block, and then you count the number of, uh, of, of transactions in a terabyte, and that gives you a very large TPS figure. Uh, there are many other tricks like this that you could pull. So we're going to see that. That's one thing. Um, and there are other people who are going to push on us different techniques. And those other techniques are going to be uh, involving a trade-off in a direction we really shouldn't go. And that direction is centralization. We all know that on my laptop I can do about 100,000 TPS. You should not buy a coin backed by my laptop. That's a bad idea. You sh nor should you buy a coin backed by AWS or a bunch of machines operating on AWS. So we need to preserve that which is most precious. We need to preserve that got us so excited and into this room in the first place. And that is the decentralized nature of these systems, the lack of control that they provide to their participants. And I want to talk to you today about two different techniques for doing this. The first one is to examine this at the network layer. So if you were to sort of think about the emerging stack, you will notice that, uh, that there is the consensus layer on top of which lies the smart contract layer, on top of which we have applications. That's all fine and dandy, but forgotten underneath these three layers is the network layer, the layer that's responsible for ferrying messages between miners, validators, block producers, and so on. And therein lies an enormous opportunity that I feel is not really being tapped by various different projects. The way we build that, pro that uh, layer is, uh, is essentially a copycat of what we saw in Bitcoin. All of the participants to a peer-to-peer -peer network essentially operate a store and forward network. I receive a packet from you, I validate it, I sit on it, I hem and haw, and then I, I, process, I uh, send it on to other people downstream of me. This is fine, but this is not how you build a high-performance network. And uh, so we took a critical look at this, and as part of a project that was initially named Falcon, uh, we built a new Bitcoin relay network that, fair, that has been faring for the last two years every single Bitcoin block and every single Bitcoin transaction between miners. So um, that project morphed into a company called BlocksRoute that generalized the idea of ferrying packets and tokenizing this process so that it can be made into a sustainable non-hobby operation. We want to be able to provide this to every coin on Earth in a transparent manner without having to cause any kind of a protocol change. So uh, the core idea here, of course, is to democratize mining, is to, is to even out the differences so that somebody from Estonia can actually compete on an equal footing with a group of miners all bunched together in the Shenzhen province of China. They have an enormous advantage from being close together, and uh, we want the, the participants to these networks from faraway locations to enjoy the same benefits as they also enjoy tapping into resources that are available in other parts of the world. So as far as I know, BlocksRoute is the only layer zero solution that's examining this, this forgotten layer. It goes underneath the blockchain. It is not proposing a change to the consensus layer. It is compatible with all other consensus protocols on top. And um, it's, in essence, I kind of think of it as the Akamai play, what, what Akamai was to the internet, uh, BlocksRoute wants to be to the blockchain world. The core task here is to take important financial timely data 
high value data from the people who produce it and deliver it to people who need it. And so that includes, of course, transactions in one direction and blocks in another direction in a traditional proof of work system. And of course, the, the sort of the topology changes when you go to proof of stake protocols and other consensus protocols. As I said, it goes underneath coins. It's coin agnostic. And our goal is very much that we will support multiple coins on top, that you can have various different coins all utilizing the same infrastructure. That infrastructure is maintained and managed by a single central entity, the Bloxrap. And yet, it is trustless. And so that word is kind of confusing. That means that, uh, that the infrastructure is trustworthy. You do not have to trust me to be able to use it and to, to have full faith that it's operating correctly. And this is a very, very nice situation to be in. The three core techniques it uses to gain the efficiencies it does is that it uses internal caching and compression. It uses a pro a something called cut-through routing. Uh, and that's something that was brought into networking when we needed higher speeds out of networks in the late 80s, early 90s. So we used to have store and forward networks throughout the 70s and early 80s. And of course, you can only push that horse so far. And when it failed, we started, okay, well, we need higher speeds and we need to go to this process known as cut-through routing where elements uh, forward messages without having to uh, re have received it in, in their entirety in the first place. That greatly cuts down on messaging latencies. And of course, end-to-end -end encryption, such that the underlying infrastructure, the blocks route infrastructure, does not need to be trusted, nor is it in a position where it can do selective censorship or any other malfeasance by looking at the contents of the packets it forwards. So um, as I mentioned, it's, um, it's, a, uh, it's a system that does not require any protocol changes and gives us an enormous speed up in terms of, um, in terms of the, uh, the, the uh, throughput that it supports. And there's an interesting token that dynamics that's based on this blocks route mechanism. The, uh, the selling point, or the win-win-win scenario, as we like to call it, is that as coins use blocks route to route their packets, they can actually make um, uh, bigger blocks that carry more transactions. They can reduce the fee per transaction while increasing the benefits to the miners because the miners' sum total fees will be higher. And blocks route from this process takes a, a small portion of the miner's fee and puts it into a reserve where the blocks route tokens give the, the token holders the right to redeem part of that reserve. So it's an interesting system and I think it's a self-sustaining system such that we can have now uh, some kind of a healthy underlying system uh, that allows people to build high-speed infrastructure for blockchains of all kinds. I now want to switch gears a little bit, and I want to tell you about what happens at the layer on top. Blocks route is what we will need when we solve the problems at the consensus layer. When you really make the consensus layer efficient, you will find that it's the, really the network that is the bottleneck. We are currently dealing with bottlenecks at the consensus layer because we haven't really been able to, uh, to, to push them out of the system. We haven't been able to, uh, to make that portion of the system as efficient as it could be. When we do, we'll find that blocks route is, is the next big thing. Now I want to focus on the consensus layer. And something really, really interesting happened earlier this spring. On around May 19, 2018, a group that calls itself Team Rocket dropped a PDF on IPFS. And uh, this PDF is a big paper that explains, uh, that describes a new consensus protocol family. Now, just to sort of orient you, there have only been about three major consensus protocol families in about 40 years of distributed systems research. Okay. So, what are these families? Well, they're really, uh, it all started out with, I think, Leslie Lamport uh, and Barbara Liskow's work, uh, who essentially started this field of classical consensus protocols. They've done a lot of work on uh, how to create, uh, how, to, how to essentially achieve uh, this thing that we want, which is a group of machines remaining in sync, uh, making the same decisions in tandem. So uh, both uh, Lamport and Luskov have Turing Awards, um, and they came up with an amazing family that has been explored to great detail uh, by now. So there are maybe hundreds, if not thousands, of papers on classical consensus protocols. These protocols are used in things like Corda, Hyperledger, et cetera, et cetera. If you're using a permissioned blockchain, you are most likely using uh, one, of the, one of the protocols in the classical family. All of these protocols provide quick finality. Okay, so they make decisions relatively quickly, uh, definitely compared to uh, proof-of-work systems, like, especially like Bitcoin. 
Um, but they have some drawbacks. One of the main drawbacks they have is that you have to know who's part of your system. The correctness of these protocols depends entirely on me knowing who's in the system, thus deciding that I can talk to a subset of the system. So there's like, let's say 50 people in, well, let's say 300 people in this room. Uh, I then talk to 200 people in the room, and then if he were to do a read from another 200, he would be certain that there's at least 50 nodes in common between the set I wrote and the set he read. And therefore, he can tolerate about 49 bad actors. All of the proofs in this entire family, about three decades of research, come down to reasoning about these intersections. And as a result, those, to get the intersection sizes right, these systems tend to be very fragile. They tend to have this permissioning step. They tend to require that everybody agree at all times on, on the set of people that are part of the system. And uh, messaging complexity for, for most of these protocols is quadratic. So everybody talks to everybody for a couple of rounds. So that's n squared, and n squared grows really, really fast. So if you have 100 validators in your system, which is a pretty small number, we've seen uh, groups of 20 start to collude and start create cartels already. Right? So um, if you have 100 nodes, that's about, uh, about 100 squared, is about 10,000 messages in the network. So as you go to uh, you know, 200, you suddenly have 40,000 messages, and it goes up from there. So this is OK for small permission deployments, but not really good for an open permissionless network. Now, Nakamoto came into the scene, and he was brilliant in, in his uh, cons uh, consensus, family, uh, uh, consensus protocol family. And his brilliance came from the, the, uh, the observation that he would have this growing blockchain uh, with probabilistic guarantees, probabilistic but very strong guarantees. Um, but sadly, those guarantees require a different mode of thinking. The latencies are high. You have to wait for a block. And for Bitcoin, it's 10 minutes. Uh, the throughput is necessarily limited. The throughput is capped at whatever block size divided by block frequency. And it just doesn't scale with the increasing numbers of, of nodes in the system. And worst of all, it wastes energy. So about two... Uh, two nuclear power plants worth of energy goes into proof-of-work consensus. Uh, if you want to visualize how much that is, that's all of Denmark's electricity consumption is going into this. So it's a lot of energy spent on proof-of-work systems. Avalanche changes all this. It's a totally different approach to how to do consensus, and I want to run through it with you and, and just give you a glimpse of how it works, because it's actually incredibly elegant and very simple to understand. Uh, but let me first go through the, the features it has. Uh, it achieves quick, late, uh, quick finality. So it, uh, it can tell you whether or not the transaction has been approved within about a few seconds. So one to two seconds is what we're aiming for. It achieves very high throughput. At the moment, our uh, lab deployment is getting in excess of 10,000 transactions per second. It scales to more than thousands of participants. So you, too, could be part of this system. You, too, could be the Jihan Wu of this new uh, coin to come. And in fact, if you think about it, Jihan is fantastic in, in his ability to, to build uh, hardware, but he's no different than you are when it comes to serializing transactions. He's got nothing on you, and you should be able to compete with him uh, if only the consensus protocol would let you, and this one does. It's robust, it's, uh, it scales, uh, it doesn't have uh, any sort of a notion of uh, membership, and it's quiescent, if there is nothing to do, it doesn't do anything, it's green, uh, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't melt the polar ice caps down, essentially. Okay, so what's the insight? Well, roughly speaking, those of you who've seen gossip protocols or you've seen gossip networks in other contexts uh, will immediately recognize how this works. It works by people talking to each other and sampling uh, where, you know, what the sentiment is. Okay? And, uh, but there is a unique part. So gossip is only used for dissemination. Gossip systems are nice, but they can't guarantee anything to you that you will agree. So uh, Avalanche does. So here's how it works. Let me just sort of illustrate how this is. Imagine that we're in a very, very, very crowded, ginormous stadium. And we don't know who's in it. You know, there are 50,000 people, and, uh, you know, and they're mixed. And we're going to make a decision, red or blue. And everybody has a favorite color stuck on their forehead, red or blue. And the worst scenario that we could be in is a 50-50 split. So 25,000 people like red, 25,000 like blue. And so we want everybody to pick the same color, all the correct nodes to pick the same color. So how would we achieve this? So we could do Nakamoto, 
Um, for that, we would need mining, and then you'd have to come to the stadium with a little mining rig, and somebody would have to be the, hey, I'm leader, I have a block, blah, blah, blah. We could do that. Um, or we could do uh, classical, in which case I talk to everybody, you talk to everybody, so 50,000 squared is a huge number, that's just not gonna work, okay? Here is how it works in Avalanche. Every node in round one picks a very small number of other nodes and samples them. So I ask five of you, just randomly, uh, what color are you like? And I will get back some answers. It's gonna be, let's say, red, red, blue, red, blue. Upon hearing this, I say, okay, it looks like there's a slight bias in the network towards red from my perspective based on my limited sampling. I'm going to add to that bias by flipping myself to the red color. Meanwhile, every other node will be doing the exact same thing. Oh, I, I have some graphics here, I should show. Meanwhile, uh, every other node will be doing the exact same thing. So uh, she might be doing the same thing over there, and she might sample red, she might sample blue, it depends. But you can see that if we are simultaneously doing this, at the end of the first round, all of us will move from a 50-50 split to most likely having oversampled either the red or the blue. The chances of being exactly at 50-50 are pretty small. They're still there, but very small. So what will happen? Well, more li most likely we will be in a different mode. We will have sampled uh, more reds or more blues, and we'll be in a 51-49 split. And now you can see how it grows from there. Once the, the split is not even, the next round will amplify that little noise that we created in the first round. And now in the second round, we're more likely to sample reds because we sampled more reds in the very first round. So we might go from 51 to uh, 53, 47, and from there we will go to, let's say, whatever it is, 55, uh, 45, et cetera, et cetera. And as you get more and more and more of the same signal, the chances of actually going towards that direction increase. Um, and we, there might be nodes that take a step back. You know, it could well be that he samples a bunch of blues and turns blue. That's okay. Uh, we'll repeat this process so as to get him back into the fold. And at the end of this process, we're going to find that the entire network will, what we call snowball, will just roll down the hill, gathering strength, and end up at, a, at an energy trough, at a very low energy state where there are no more flips to be done. So you will look around the stadium after a very modest number of rounds, 15 to 17 or so, and everyone that's correct will have the same color card on their foreheads. It's magical, uh, the math is really quite interesting, and in fact, the proof techniques used in this paper are quite different. They're stochastic, they're physics-based, um, and very different from uh, the proof techniques that are used in uh, other systems. This gives rise to a very egalitarian ecosystem. It's green, there's no miners, everybody participates in decision-making. It's maximally concurrent, and this entire system overall, I didn't mention this, uh, but the entire system creates a DAG down underneath at the very lowest layer, which means that it can concurrently work on multiple different transactions at the same time, achieving very, very high throughputs as a result. So those big numbers I showed you are a, are a side effect of that, of that uh, property. So I'm currently building a company called Ava Labs, and it's building a coin called Ava uh, based on this core mechanism. There are a couple of interesting features of this new coin to come. Uh, we not only uh, use Avalanche, which is this really uh, interesting uh, new consensus protocol, but we're also rethinking everything that happens on top. And if you look at sort of what the developers have been doing, they've been in this mentality of one coin, one VM. And one of the things that we're planning to change about in Ava is to have multiple virtual machines. So in Ava, you can have Bitcoin script, you know, Nava, you can have Ethereum, you know, the EVM, or any other, you know, if you want to ring signatures from Monero, you'll be able to have these things. So you should be able to create any coin with any combination of scripting languages that you desire. The Sybil deterrence will be done by stake. That is, uh, you're going to need some Ava coins to ensure that you have some stake in the game, that you're not going to, to misbehave. But unlike classical algorithms that use that stake as a punishment mechanism, there is no slashing conditions in Ava. There is no danger of losing your stake. Okay. So no funds loss. Even if your node completely misbehaves, you know, your processor goes haywire, your memory is corrupted or whatever, there is nothing you can emit into the network that will cause you to lose your funds. And there's one other interesting feature of this entire uh, system that uh, is essentially using the, the unique underlying layer that Ava provides, which is uh, we can actually do economic governance 
based on, on the core consensus mechanism. So if you look at coins like, uh, like uh, Bitcoin and you know, whatever, any coin actually, there are certain key parameters that necessarily have to be set at creation time. Bitcoin has this uh, emissions curve, for example, and uh, it's just what it is. And sometimes, you know, Satoshi got it right, and the emissions curve is just right. And, uh, you know, we're printing money that's, you know, exactly right for the demand. Sometimes we're behind and, this, and the price goes to the moon, that's nice too. Uh, but sometimes we're way ahead and then the price tanks. So it would be very, very nice to be able to, uh, to change that within limits, of course, uh, to change, you know, respecting certain invariants about, for example, the maximum number of coins to be produced. Uh, but it would be very nice to be able to change it uh, so as to achieve certain outcomes. So one thing you can do, for example, in AVA is ask the crowd whether or not they would go along with a change to the system that would um, allow the, um, the uh, that would change, for example, a key parameter, like the interest rate or like the staking amount. Okay, so we're going to have AVA, the native token, which will serve as a payment rail. And, uh, and people often talk about consensus in Bitcoin as if it's some kind of a magical way to sample the opinions of, of the crowd. It's not. It's all about asking miners, right? You're asking, are you capable of um, procuring cheap electricity and a bunch of hardware? So uh, that's how you get voice on the blockchain in Bitcoin. In, it's, so, but in AVA it is. You really are sampling all of the participants in the system. And that's a very, very interesting way to be able to build a crowd oracle and to build a, a system that is capable of taking input from the crowd and finding a consensus point if one is achievable. It could well be that there is no change that everybody will accept, in which case AVA does not guarantee that you will actually achieve that, right? So it doesn't make social consensus appear out of nowhere, um, but if there is a point to be found, it will find it. So, um, uh, yeah, so I will uh, sort of cut through this stuff uh, very, very quickly. Um, but we've been working on Alva and, and, and extending it. Uh, we've been in stealth mode for some time. And uh, we've been, uh, one of the main features that we've added recently is the support for smart contracts. And, um, uh, okay. So just to give you some numbers, uh, the performance of the system is, is incredibly high. Uh, so this is a, you know, just a, a simple latency graph. You can see that Bitcoin for its uh, probabilistic guarantees requires about six confirmations. Uh, Ethereum, uh, you know, about 555 seconds of confirmations for equivalent security. Uh, in Algorand, it actually provides stronger security than Bitcoin, uh, weaker security than AVA, and it takes about 50 seconds. And, uh, and in AVA, it's about four seconds. So, and the throughput is an order of magnitude faster than anything else. Uh, these numbers are already incredibly dated, uh, but for some reason I could not edit this slide, so this graphic specifically, so it is what it is. Uh, the actual numbers that we're getting are far in excess of what is shown here. So, um, with that, what I want to sort of summarize this on is, we got ourselves into a bit of a pickle. We sold a dream. It's a very compelling dream. It gets everybody excited. I know it gets me excited in the mornings uh, when I think about things to come. Uh, but that dream is really, really far from, from the chains of today. And we need new uh, protocols at all layers of this new emerging stack. Bloxroot is an attempt to uh, approach that layer zero, the underlying, the most fundamental layer uh, of communication, and to make it go fast and to tokenize it. Uh, Avalanche and, and the Ava coin built on top is, a, is an attempt at, uh, at, uh, at layer one, uh, which is the consensus layer, and it embodies a set of ideas uh, that are fresh and only the third of their kind, in my view, in about 40 years of research. So I'm very, very excited about the shape of things to come. Thank you.